too much medicine. Right. Then we have three speakers uh, uh, who will be addressing you today. And before I begin the symposium itself, and I know how many of you are members of Excel Learning. Can you have a show of hands? Those of you who are not already members of Excel Learning, I want to welcome you to become members of Excel Learning. Because you will be a member of the oldest of all mental and professional associations of Asia and Australasia. And there are a lot of advantages when you become a member of Excel Learning. Right? You, you, you will be able to receive that month, uh, monthly newsletter free of charge, which contains a lot of material of all the work done for the, for the month. And also it's good for your, for your CPD uh, uh, knowledge. Furthermore, you will get the e-bulletin free of charge and uh, you will be eligible to uh, receive travel grants given by this CNA. And also you will be able to showcase your research that you do in the annual academic sessions which will be held in July this year. And apart from that, you can also take part in other social activities, in, uh, in the cricket matches, in the netball, uh, in the netball tournament. And also can uh, come to uh, and you know come to the uh, to the cinema dance. So those of us who are not already members, I have application forms here. So I do hope you will take these application forms and become members before you go before you leave the room, right? So please uh, beca do become members of the cinema. We have we have uh, around 4,000. I'm hoping to build up the 4,000 program into the real world. So please, those of you who want application forms, please join. My coach here is uh, Dr. Saran Gangli. And the third round is now getting good speakers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very important topic. Topic which is being discussed by all the patients. I don't know how how frequently discussed by the themselves. Whether with all the equipment available to us, with all the facilities, whether we are over diagnosing conditions, and with all the new drugs available to us, whether we are over treating as well. So to discuss that, we have to open the to you guys, Kumar Mendes to discuss why bother about this topic at all. So, come on, Mendes. So, you can... And Professor Kumar Mendes has been interested in this topic all the time. He happens to be the Professor of Family Medicine at the Columbia North uh, Medical School. afternoon and thank you very much for being here. When I when we started this uh, thinking about this session, I was not sure whether we could get uh, three or four speakers to speak on this topic. And I persuaded uh, Agnes, uh, the editor, and he said uh, uh, we will try to get at least two more. But I am very happy to say that uh, all the people who we approach did not have any doubts and some were telling how much time would you give us to speak on? That was the question. So, uh, I think, madam, we need an overhaul of the technology in the most, uh, yeah. So, right. Okay. 
reduce the topic too much over diagnosis most of our doctors want to do good i have been we have been discussing this just a few minutes ago nobody really means to do harm so but few would agree with uh, the famous uh, writer ivan ilich that medical establishment has come to a to a threat to health care i don't think we have gone that far but uh, we may agree on with uh, one of the uh, foremost uh, health economists alan etowan that uh, increasing medical inputs will at some stage become counterproductive and produce more harm than good i don't think anybody will have much problems with the statement so my question is have we got into that tipping point where we have to decide whether we are doing good or harm or is the balance tilting towards harm very simple definition of over diagnosis over diagnosis occurs when individuals are diagnosed with conditions that will never cause symptoms or death there are many definitions this is a very simple definition so some of the other names that we give are over medicalization and subsequent over treatment some called diagnosis creep shifting thresholds this is a very nice thing that has been happening shifting the threshold of blood pressure diabetes you name it it is happening now and this is mongering let me give one example of shifting thresholds everybody will know this what happened in 2017 when they tweak the blood pressure the numbers are very very clear according to the new guidelines in 2017 of the american uh, heart association the number of people labeled as having hypertension will increase in the us by 26% and in china 45% so 75 million in the us and 55.3 million in china would be newly recommended for treatment with hypertensive drugs right so and i don't have the time to play this uh, very nice video by uh, professor alan francis who was the dsm4 chairperson and when he when he uh, narrates the story of what happened in dsm3 to 5 how people created psychiatric illnesses and by the time the some of the people slept they did not have any psychiatric illness by the time they woke up about 1 million people had a psychiatric problem and the man himself says he is a chairperson of dsm4 and he didn't get the uh, chairperson uh, to attest five but he was in the committee because he was dead against meddling about with thresholds and to the children what we are doing there's a nice article in pediatrics about you know when we were disruptive we got a spanking but now we are given a drug right so this is again not from third or fourth class uh, journals it is a journal of pediatrics they identify nine conditions where we may be doing harm however not all agree that over diagnosis is happening and about 10% of the people argue and among the the main journals who are arguing that oh, no 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 don't worry is an english journal of medicine right and they question the list is more crusaded by jama are we over medicalizing or over simplifying i mean that's a fair question so the bmj has replied 
very nicely and this word was not coined one or two years ago it has been there for the last 50 years so i have not starting with screening as you will get a very good dose of i think low dose radiation on screening by uh, so i am not going to speak about that much 2002 the bmj started this campaign the question was it too much medicine but in 2014 it is too much medicine there's no problem they have gone on the campaign and chama joined in in 2010 and there's a very nice even a, a person who is driving the car can hear this kind of audio uh, 10 minutes audio on the breast cancer surgery which clearly says less is more the book that uh, created a very very uh, wide opinion on from the journalists the patients and the doctors are this over diagnosis making people sick in pursuit of health this was a worldwide best seller and now every year from 2012 Preventing over diagnosis. There is a world conference, and the last uh, uh, conference, uh, the coming conference, will be in Sydney, Australia, and at least 500 plus of academics and doctors are supposed to. Normally, the the last uh, statistics of uh, uh, the people who uh, went for the 2018 was 500. So, why bother? this came one month ago from the cochrane now we are the gps are very fond of dental health checks so as the package deals from all private sector hospitals very clearly says i will read it because it is very very uh, infrequent they are cochrane reviews give a very clear they will always tell we have to do more research here no two words key message the systematic review was done the aim of this cochrane review was to find out general health checks whether it reduces ill illness and deaths so the conclusion was systematic effects of health checks are unlikely to be beneficial and may lead to unnecessary test and treatment this came out last month very clear and there's a nice thing that the nhs do is doing now this is the top part of a slide interventions which should be not be routinely commissioned or performed and they give a very nice bit of evidence and 95% snoring surgery dilatation and curettage for increase menstrual bleeding knee arthroscopy and spinal injections very clear why bother again the cost these are 4 billion estimated in us dollars on breast cancer over diagnosis in the us now about the suffering i told you why we are concerned because the evidence is there the cost is prohibitive and what about the suffering right this is again uh, taken from the lancet 2017 if you take 1000 women and screen them for 20 years you will prevent four deaths from breast cancer but eight women will still die this is not suffering but next now this is suffering during that period 1000 women 412 women will experience a false positive result and 67 women will have a biopsy and 345 some other extra test so the massive psychological physical suffering that goes on this is very very methodical the screening that 
was taken in Canada, US and UK. The summary statistics. So, again, you will see it is a problem for the West, not in the East now. There is a very nice article in the BMJ again by the Indian editor. Why medicine is not a problem only in the rich countries. Mapping the drivers. Why is it going on and on and on? Why is it happening? There are some very, very nice articles written by one of a Sri Lankan doctor now in Australia about the over, uh, drivers of over diagnosis. Very briefly, it is patients and public and goes on to cultural things. And she very clearly defines the over uh, drivers, why it is going on, and gives some very nice things you can do about it. Not only talk about it, something that can be done. So, what can be done? Choosing wisely. I think some of you may have already heard about this initiative in the US by 70 specialist, specialist societies. They have come together and at one website, they have put all their college of physicians or pediatricians, everybody who has something to say, not to do, has provided this rising, uh, choosing wisely and from the US they have come to the UK and they are choosing wisely UK. All colleges and societies in one website. Can I just suggest that the SLMA madam take some initiative in getting the colleges together and the ministry and if we have some very valid recommendation put it on the a single website and maybe we can call it choosing wisely Sri Lanka. We did this about one month ago the ministry called a group of experts surgeons, radiologists and discussed about the current breast cancer screening guidelines. And we had a very nice discussion about two or three days and came out with the uh, guidelines. When I went to access the website this morning, this is the message that I get. It is not available. Website is suspended for some reason, right? So there is a very nice initiative, right? And <clears throat> you can get all this information and more in the website. You can just go there and you can read anything. Everything is reference, articles can be downloaded, everything. And thank you. I think uh, I have uh, a few minutes, but let the others, uh, some of the doctors have very nice uh, presentations, not like this one, really clinical stuff, which may listen to the next speaker. Thank you, Professor Kumar, for that very uh, enlightening uh, presentation. We we'll next move on to uh, the next uh, speaker, Professor A. Patmeswaran. He will speak on uh, screening for disease, preventing harm or harming the healthy. Uh, professor uh, Patmeswaran is Professor of Public Health at the University of uh, Kalania. And uh, over to you, Professor Patmeswaran. And he also is, uh, has been the editor of the Ceylon Medical Journal for about uh, 10 years now. For about 10 years. <laughs> three, five, three years. Three years, yes. And I was also your first house officer. Yes, and he was also my first house officer in Karapitya. The time I was there, the, uh, the hospital was opened in uh, Karapitya. That was. Uh, that was in the early 1980s. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, madam, and uh, thank you, Kumar, for getting me into this. The title is nothing original. I saw an article in the PLOS Medicine about five, six years ago about uh, screening for chronic kidney disease, preventing harm or harming the healthy, and I am interested in screening, so I thought I will use this title one whenever I get a chance, so I have got my chance. Uh, I mean, all of us are keen on screening because we believe that right? it's actually a belief, not really a truth as such. We believe that it reduces morbidity and mortality from the diseases because we find them early among people screened. And the detection and appropriate treatment leads to better outcome. That is our belief and based on that belief, we think we should do more and more screening. Uh, and the, there are possible, there are benefits of screening in the sense screening and early detection could improve prognosis, reduce morbidity, and uh, both these together may be improved quality of life. And uh, there is this uh, strong belief that it reduces resources needed for treatment. Yes, for individual cases, if you detect early and treat them early, it reduces the resources needed. But if you look at the supermarket analogy, you are going to treat a large number of people, small benefits, large number of people. So then if you calculate the cost, it may not be a real cost uh, a benefit in terms of cost, right? Then the last one is a good one. That's because reassurance from a correct negative test. This is people who are, who don't know that uh, what breast cancer is or who don't know what prostate cancer is and they are living happily. And we make them worried by talking to them about breast cancer and prostate cancer. We do the test and then say, ah, now you don't have to go. Like, I mean, this is really, I don't know why people get it so much, but you get But, uh, I mean, screening is associated with increased survival time and reduced case fatality. This is what the main selling point of screening. Right? And uh, before we can say that this is really valid, we'll have to make sure that it, is it really real or is it some sort of bias? And there are two types of bias that can lead to this increased survival time and reduced case fatality. One is called the lead time bias and the other one is called the length bias. I would like to just try to demonstrate what these are. Right. So if you say that uh, there is a progression of any disease, right, starts with biological onset, and after some time, it is detectable by a screening test. And even after some more time, there may be symptoms and people will come to doctors and we can detect them. And uh, death. Or we can delay death by screening and uh, appropriate treatment. That's what we believe. In the sense that there will be a longer gap between diagnosis and death. This longer gap between diagnosis and death the time between diagnosis and death could be due to actually delayed death. I'm not talking about screening here. I'm talking about actually improved uh, therapeutic measures. Say if you are talking about uh, some uh, um, leukemias and stuff like that, we know during our lifetime there is increased survival, improved survival, right? So that is really possible. But also the, you can have increase survival, not because we have done anything to the expiry date, but by increasing or earlier detection and labeling them early. Because we have labeled, the, detected the case early, we have no influence on survival, but it looks like there is longer survival because they have been labeled for a longer period of time. But what we believe is the third option, earlier diagnosis leads to delayed death. And uh, it's not 
even the fourth possibility is real in the sense earlier diagnosis and a slightly earlier death. Right? So they are still labeled for a longer period of time and it looks as if there is uh, increased survival. So if you look at this uh, same uh, graphic again, so instead of somebody being labeled at 50 years and dying at 60, I mean, I made this slide about five, six years ago before I reached 60. If I had make it again, I would shift these ages a bit, right? So, if, if you are labeled at 50 and die at 60, right? If, if you are labeled a little bit earlier, you just, even if there is no survival benefit, it looks as if you have lived longer with the disease, right? So, it is the responsibility of the people who are promoting screening to show that it is not this artifact, there is really real benefit. Right? The length bias is, uh, say if you think of a malignancy which has two different types, one is a very aggressive type and the other one is a very, uh, not you can say a malignancy, benign, uh, a low grade malignancy, right? An aggressive and a low grade one. So you will just imagine that each of these kill people at 60 years of age, right? One takes five years to grow, the other one takes 25 years to grow, right? The aggressive one is in five years it kills. The other one, so it starts at 55 and kills, the other one starts at 35 and kills. And each of these have different periods of uh, uh, disease-free but uh, mm -hmm. detectable by uh, screening test, right? So. For the aggressive one, this detectable period is only one year. Before symptoms appear, there is one year of screen possible period. For the uh, low grade one, this period is five years. Right? So if we have a screening program that goes every five years, it's definitely more likely to catch a lot of type 2 diseases than type 1 diseases because only 20% of type 1 diseases can be caught if you have a five yearly screening cycle, but 100% of low grade disease can be caught if you have a five yearly uh, screening cycle. So based on this, if you don't have to do a lot of mathematics or statistics to realize this, screen detected will have definitely a better prognosis than uh, clinically presenting cases. Right? So that is the other possibility because of this length bias. Now, these can be seen in uh, prostate cancer data very clearly in almost all countries. I just looked at the data from Finland, right? The y-axis on the left is standardized mortality ratio. This is a very simple metric where we look at uh, because prostate cancer patients are going to be older than other people. So, you can't just look at their mortality rate. You have to look at their mortality rate in comparison to similar aged people. Right? So the SMR gives you how bad is their mortality compared to people of that particular age. And if it is the same as that age, it should be an SMR of 1. Anything more than SMR of 1 indicates higher mortality. So what it shows is the blue line at the top is overall for all cases of uh, prostate cancer. What is the SMR? And uh, in the 1980s or late 80s, it was more than 2 and it has come down to about uh, 1.4 or even less than that, 1.3 by the end of the, in that period 2005-2009. If you look at localized prostate cancer, the rates for SMR for localized prostate cancer, it's starting somewhere around 1.4, 1.5. And uh, the interesting thing is it is coming to less than one towards the end of uh, this uh, epidemic of prostate cancer. That is what is shown in the green line, right? That is with the DSA screening, the number of cases have gone up, right? So now I said the SMR of one means your mortality is similar to people at the average mortality. So does it mean that... Uh, it is good to have early localized prostate cancer because it reduces your mortality. No, it is not. What it shows is that uh, a common uh, phenomenon uh, which was uh, 
made into focus by what's Julian Tudor Hart about the inverse care law. People who really don't need it will access care. Right? So this all this prostate screening is being done by the really healthy people who don't need it. Right? So their mortality rate is less than the average mortality rate and that is what is being shown by this uh, red line going below the SMR of 1. Right? So this is in Finland but I am sure if we have the data in Sri Lanka we can do it for us also. So about 50-60 years ago this was uh, uh, developed by two researchers Wilson and Jungner about prerequisites for successful screening and they, it's a very simple common sense things they have said what should be there for successful screening the condition should be an important health problem there should be an accepted treatment for patients with the disease so we should know exactly who a patient is and how to treat these people and facilities for treatment and diagnosis should be available not in your teaching hospital but for everybody otherwise there is an equity problem also right? and there should be a recognized test there should be a suitable test or examination usually nowadays there is a suitable test looking for a disease and we find the disease right and the natural history of the condition should be adequately understood i mean if we don't know the condition adequately we shouldn't start screening and uh, the ninth one is very important the cost should be economically balanced in relation to possible expenditure on medical care as a whole right? i mean there is nothing free nothing cheap if you spend it on screening, you are going to not spend it on something else. This is not only true for a developing or a middle income country like ours. Even the richest countries can't have everything. Say if they spend on something, they have to cut it down from something else. So we'll have to decide whether this is what we want to spend our resources. So what are these possible adverse effects associated with screening? long period of morbidity right because we have labeled them and they are going to be more and diagnosis of pseudo disease and over treatment i mean prostate cancer which wouldn't have come out which wouldn't have uh, caused any problems to the patient which would not have killed the patient is now diagnosed and they know that they have it and then this false reassurance from a false negative test if you are a clinician you will know that there are people who have had a uh, say pap smear or something negative and then even when they develop symptoms they don't go to the doctor soon enough because they have recently had a uh, negative test right and so that is a real problem and anxiety and morbidity associated with the false positive test is real i mean we can always say ah no 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 we have done so many other tests and now it's all negative that was a false positive and the concept of false positive is very difficult people will think there was something, a small thing was wrong, but vast majority is right. That is what they will think, right? So it's not easy to get rid of this anxiety associated with the false positive test. And uh, diverting resources is the other issue. So what we usually do is we usually say burden warrants a program. Is there a test? Yes, there is a test. Are they effective treatment? Yes, all this we can say yes. But the last one is very important. Has the effectiveness been demonstrated? What I mean by effectiveness being demonstrated is not the effectiveness of the test or the effectiveness of the treatment. Effectiveness of the program as a whole. Right? When you screen a group of uh, individuals or community, do you show decreased morbidity, mortality in that community? That is what is meant by this uh, effectiveness being demonstrated the last one i want to show is a picture i took at a government hospital in sri lanka just two months ago uh, the poster is in the patient's waiting area and the whiteboard is inside the consultation area right and uh, the poster <laughs> is asking people to find whether they have got uh, uh, osteoporosis or not and uh, the OS drugs, even the, my 40-year-old pharmacology <laughs> tells me that some of these are important drugs. There are things like thyroxine, there is HCT, 
and uh, a lot of things you ask for drugs none of this is available and in small letters and internet is also there that is not available in this hospital and uh, we are screening them for osteoporosis thank you thank you for the padma sir Uh, let me remind each speaker will speak for 15 minutes and next it would be dr kanta samrai from the consultant radiologist who will talk to us on mammography for breast cancer screening the good the bad and the ugly <laughs> Good morning. I think I must thank Dr. Kumar Mendes and also Dr. Indra and Amar Singh. Point that in actually my invitation came to Dr. Indra and Amar Singh, who is the consultant oncologist, as an oncosurgeon. So on too much medicine, my topic is mammography screening for breast cancer. Whether it's good, bad, or whether there's anything ugly, <laughs> that's how Dr. Kumar Mendes wanted me to speak on. Uh, simply now, actually, I am not going to talk too much on statistics and things, but the practical situation of practical setup of mammography screening. So, simply, what's a mammogram? Simply, it's a breast X-ray image using soft low KV X-rays. So, on a chest X-ray, we use about 120 kV, or 20 to 30 kilowatts. <coughs> And now we have developed. Technically, our mammography field has developed, and we get different types of, technically different types of mammograms. So we are all used to film screen system of mammogram, that is conventional analog type. Those mammograms, of course, now getting replaced by digital mammograms, almost everywhere. Digital mammogram has a very significantly high resolution. And very, you get a very, you get a very clear picture. Actually, this, all these things are important for planning a screening mammogram uh, project. And we have gone beyond that now. We get the uh, tomosynthesis that is called. Uh, we can add to digital mammogram a thing called tomosynthesis, and which has a very high resolution and which gives us very, uh, very much more details. What is tomosynthesis? Actually, it's a, it produces us a, gives us a 3D image of the breast. Oh, the video is not playing. There's a video, it's not playing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Small clip. So anyway, what we are doing is we take multiple projections over the breast in an arc fashion, and Reconstruct to give give us a uh, 3D image. No, I'll get I'll give you again. Let's let me come. So it's, it's okay, right? Okay. So now we have advanced very much, and with actually as we go on, we will see the difference between the conventional mammogram and the Digital mammogram plus or minus uh, tomosynthesis, and there are clinically two types of mammograms. One is diagnostic mammogram. Diagnostic mammogram is done on a clinically positive patient to get to analyze further the what is the known lesion or the presenting complaint. And the other type is screening mammogram that is done on a male woman asymptomatic patient. Now that is our concern today. So, what is screening mammogram? That we we know that is done on a normal 
women. We have to invite them for a screening mammogram. What is our aim actually? So doing a screening mammogram, now as Dr. Babnanser mentioned, whatever screen, we have to detect some lesion early. So that's good. We are going to detect a lesion at a very early stage. We may detect a precancerous lesion or we may detect if it's a cancer in non-invasive non stage and if it's an invasive cancer, we have to detect it at early age. So if we can do this, good. That is our target or the goal. And if you are planning a screening program, you should have some basic idea about these things also. What is the bilateral incidence? We get a synchronous. That's if you diagnose cancer in bilateral breast at the same time or at least within three months of primary diagnosis. That is one to two percent. So you can't forget about the other breast. And the metachronous, that is diagnosis beyond after three months, still bilateral, it occurs in five to six percent. Why is this important? That is, uh, mortal rate goes about, it is about four times higher in bilateral cancer, it diagnosed within five years. <coughs> so, you have to remember this. So, there are several advantages. If you are doing a proper screening program, if you detect a pre-malignant lesion, you can do a follow-up or if you are willing, you can treat. Then if it's an invasive cancer, you have to detect early. If you detect early, of course, there are several games. You can escape by mastectomy. You can avoid mastectomy. And by doing this conservation surgery, you can avoid axillary appearance, which, is, which gives a lot of morbidity to our house, uh, uh, housewives. And you may even avoid chemotherapy. So it's a big advantage. If you detect an early cancer, you can avoid all these things and good morbidity. And if somebody is planning a screening program, you must have basic idea about how these breast presents. You have fatty breast and at the end very dense breast. About 10% have very fatty breast. We like this type of breast very much because it's very easy to very easy to diagnose lesions in this type of fatty breast. And about 40% have hetero, uh, I mean, scattered density, another 40% uh, heterogeneous breast density, and the 10% very dense breast, where diagnosis is very difficult. And if you are, planning, if you are going to do a screening program or a surveillance program, you should have the pre planned modules. We can just Advertise a training program and ask the people to come. So, we should have preliminary modules. We have to define the population category. Then we are going to do mass scale, island wide, or district wide program. Then, whether there's a special target group or some workers, or officers, or teachers. Then, most important group is high risk group, whether we are going to define uh, limit into the high risk group, or with a random check. And we have to define the age group. It is 40 to 60. There are different age groups actually recommended by uh, American College of Surgeons, American College of Radiologists and Cancer Societies. And they say there are different advantages of doing screening programs in different age groups. So in 40 to 69, if you start early 40 years, they say life gain, life years gain is more. Likewise, in 50 to 69, there is a peak incidence. That is the age group which we get peak incidence of cancer. So there are several advantages and also uh, disadvantages. And we have to define the interval. So they are going to do annual mammogram. No point of just doing one mammogram in the screen room. We have to follow it up. So there is annual mammogram, biennium, that means two yearly. Now recently in the UK they have recommended to start annual mammograms at 40 years to go until 55 and then to turn into biennium. Actually, in my personal experience, I have worked in nine, ten uh, years in cancer hospital and after that in private sector. I think this has to be decided individually, in my opinion, depending on their breast density, family history, and depending on the lesion we encounter, type of lesion. If it's fairly fatty breast, we are sure the family history, no risk, completely normal, no point of asking the to come every year for an hour. So we can get away some, sometimes it's ultrasound, but ultrasound is not the primary mode of uh, screening, it's of the mammogram, but we gain a lot on ultrasound scanning. 
i think uh, dr gunzal am saying we take to uh, in the discussion how much we gain or and how can adapt to the mammogram as a adjunct to mammogram so we have to consider all those things and uh, decide on the interval and the other setup so anyway a good screening program we have to decide define the target group then decide the interval decide the starting age and in my opinion if, you, uh, if we can at least cover this important high risk group i think we have achieved a lot that's the most important group at this you know what high risk group is i don't know time to go into those things and then define the area then then we have to invite these are normal people at our home so how to do this is very complex you can easily speak about uh, screening program but very so how to invite i mean some countries they have women's registry on their age groups i don't think to my knowledge we have a women's registry and we don't have their contact addresses after 40 years we have to catch these people after 40 years then i suggest when we know then we have to define some network for invitations i think we can start from grassroots level if you don't have a proper registry we can collect data from grassroots seva division then uh, get uh, uh, the help from primary health care workers like midwives well women clinic emol clinic and so on i think there are people who are spending on these tasks that need to decide on those things but still i think we have to expect poor compliance in our society remember about 80% things are poor population in our country so it's always bound with poor education status poor social credit background and the other thing is i uh, have personal experience on the stigma when a person has a cancer sometimes they are not exposed to it to the even immediate relations they don't like to tell the neighbors in fact i started the very limited uh, screening program for high risk group when i was in cancer hospital i tasted the colored coupon i distributed colored coupon to be tasted on to these cancer patients uh, records and uh told them to send their immediate relations over 40 years their sisters and daughters they send their daughter or <laughs> mother but they very rarely they send their sisters because i think the problem is one problem is stigma and another problem is they are not bothered and how to increase this compliance i think awareness program should go in parallel and we should have a very strong task force to decide these modules and for the planning we can get uh, cancer control unit health ministry college of radiologists association of general practitioners mohs clinic and other primary health care workers or that <coughs> not only that what about the technical now this once you do a screening program to diagnose our target is to diagnose early not just diagnose our purpose is to diagnose early disease if it's a late stage of course surgery can diagnose gp can diagnose they can feel the lumps and for biopsy diagnose or oh, that but but even that case remember once you diagnose you still need radiology to assess the multifocal lesions and the other breast you have to make sure before surgery that the other breast is negative that's also and to get the bilateral incidence you have to uh, remember that so what we Technical things we need. If you are doing a proper screening program, we need mobile machines. And conventional mobile machine, I never recommend this conventional type. It's now obsolete because we can't detect early lesion with conventional mammogram. True, we did that for years, but to go in par with other country statistics, we have to diagnose it early with a proper machine, digital. Then it's very expensive, about forty million, fifty million, the digital machine itself. And to be mobile, we need a lower cost bus. 24 hour servicing the generator so it's added cost and how many so many other practical problems then if you are using static machines they may be located in hospitals they may be in cancer centers and can our radiology staff the staff accommodate we have to think about all these things and the workload and remember the staff with regard to staff we need female radiographers not male radiographers we have to equip a female radi and the radiologist 
And this slide I put now in customs, we have all these, remember now, more modern security checks, screening devices, including switching drugs, but still drugs get escaped. See that they are uh, doing at the corner. So likewise, now once we do a costly screening program with huge investment, manpower, equipment, all efforts at time, increased workload, that and this, we can't afford to miss a lesion. Then comes the radiology stroke. It's very important when you know. We have done all that screening. Now, when we got a PET scan to cancer hospital, cancer patients thought that their cancers are cured. It's something like that. Just to diagnose. So, this is very important in this. And uh, experience and skill matters a lot. Especially in mass reporting, lesions may get easily over it. Because it's a large number of, uh, uh, now when I was uh, trained, uh, my postgraduate training in UK, I worked with actually this director of uh, London Best Screening Program in 1995, Dr. Hedda Bilavali. They do mass reporting rollers. They roll the, this thing and about hundreds are supported. It's very easily you can miss a early lesion. Early lesion. That's our purpose is to get a early lesion. But here, mass reporting lesions are very subtle. Majority are normal. So we are seeing, seeing, seeing. You are get must, I am smart, get, must get used to this type of thing, otherwise you tend to miss. And remember, we don't have best subspecialty yet in Sri Lanka. We are all general radiologists. Most of us are general radiologists. And if you are doing the vast island wide program, it's very, so many practical problems. And you should have, I think, the radiological eye to detect these early lesions. And of course, then we need proper equipments. And this is how mass reporting is being done. Actually, if you can read the sentence, is uh, Professor Sandevali, Professor of Human Faith King's College. It's now being overrated, it means. And this is how evolution is being used. This is a, still a digital mammogram, very subtle, change, hardly anything even I can see here. But when it comes to tomosynthesis, we have detected the very typical virus 5 very advanced cancer. So no point of missing these things. This looks normal. On mass scale reporting, very easily one can miss this advanced cancer. And and the, we can have double reading, it will increase by if you put two radiologists to read the mammogram, sensitivity goes up. And false positive rate comes down. That's again a challenge. This is again a subtle lesion. Very easily we can miss. And the uh, uh, ultrasound also very subtle and the MRI shows an advanced lesion. So if you detect a suspicious lesion, yes, if you have a proper channel, things will be okay. Then comes the indeterminate lesion and earlier pre-malignant lesion. Earlier pre-malignant lesion can be indeterminate for life, as Dr. Parkinson mentioned. So if you don't diagnose, patient might leave the whole lifespan. But once we diagnose, the patient comes. And sometimes we are very subtle. The follow-up is very important. The patient is anxious throughout. How frequent we have to get down is a real practical problem. And with this indirect opacity, but still we can't afford to leave it a doubt. So additional mammogram images, other imaging like ultrasound and MRI, follow-up studies. We can't forget this patient. And then whether we have to decide if this good or bad, we might end up with a biopsy and it should be false alarm and false positive article. And as already mentioned, we can't forget about the anxiety and the stress until proved as negative. It's very significant, I think. We are creating anxiety and stress among our normal women. And good, proper screening system with unaccepted guidelines, with diagnostic computer, with proper channel of reference to be commended. And good. Then we have to think whether I need the position to carry out it. And on radiologist's perspective, at the end, diagnostic capability, efficiency, and reliability to, to be made optimum in order to get the maximum benefit of screening. And over diagnosis is disadvantageous, going to disadvantageous, and going to be too much medicine, as you mentioned. And misdiagnosis is again hazardous. And my suggestion at the end, try to have super centers, at least one or two per district with all facilities. 
strengthen awareness programs via PNT PR network and enhance clinical based examinations at various clinics. And what about self based examination? That's a very important aspect. Other women are not used to this yet. Coming is the value and should be made more familiar to our women. And it has the benefit of primary health care workers. If you have time, just see that highlighted things. And the initial, this proponent, Dr. Mike, now is against the screening. And it's, it has become now more political fashion than a scientific fashion, he says. As, as you said, if you go to internet, you can get the twist. Either way you want, the advantage or the disadvantage, and the, so the statistics. Actually, this is a cinema, you have to decide. <laughs> but there's good, bad, or there's any ugly side of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanta and Samari Plummer for the presentation on uh, uh, on the mammography. Uh, Dr. Neomali Amarasen is the next speaker and she will speak on uh, overdiagnosis CT coronary angiography uh, as over treatment with stents. Dr. Neomali Amarasen, as you know, is a cardiologist at the Sri Jalapur General Hospital. Thank you. <coughs> I'd like to thank Dr. Kumar Mendes for having invited me to talk on this particular topic. It wasn't an easy one, really, because I realized having it undertaken, it there was a little data. Anyway, I'll do my best. Now, the first part of it, which is the main, main part, is really on overdiagnosis with CT coronary angiography. The other one actually follows because once you've made the diagnosis, you've got to do something and then you can stunt it. So this is a CT scanner and this is the kind of pretty picture you get when you go and do a CT coronary angiogram. It's actually much nicer than my conventional coronary angiograms which we interventional cardiologists do because we just inject a dye and you get this black and white uh, CD while here you get all these nice uh, pictures. And uh, it's become very popular, and the other problem is that just about anybody can request it because this is available in the private sector and it is just done. But one should know some little thing about CT and geography because actually CT is an important investigation because it's used to evaluate suspected aortic dissection and thoracic aneurysms. It's, it's used for suspected pulmonary embolism. Also, when you are doing radio frequency ablation for atrial fibrillation, you look at your primary veins that way. Then, of course, the coronary arteries. Also, it's used in the assessment of complex congenital heart disease, including anomalies of the coronary circulation, great vessels, chambers, and valves. Then, if you are going for, particularly if you are going for redo coronary artery bypass surgery, it is very useful in noting where the internal memories and various other arteries are. And uh, Evaluating the coronary artery bypass graph source is quite important. But unfortunately, most people are really not aware of most of these uh, uses of this CT angiogra angiography. People do know about the CT pulmonary angiogram, but everybody is now totally focused on CT coronary angiograms. The extent that most lay people also just want it done. It's actually a good tool because it's a primary clinical application of cardiac CT is the performance of a non-invasive coronary CT angiogram among patients with symptoms suggestive of myocardial ischemia. Now that is the key word. The overall accuracy of a 64 slice CT angiogram is a sensitivity of 87 to 99% and a specificity of 93 to 96%. It is the, the coronary CT angiography for evaluating coronary artery disease is most useful in low to intermediate risk patients with angina or angina equivalent. 
the negative predictive uh, predictive value of quantity CT angiography is uniformly high in studies approaching 93 to 100%. In other words, coronary CT angiography is an excellent modality for ruling out coronary heart disease. So if any of you all want to know whether you are okay, just go and do a CT coronary angiogram. Once it's ruled as negative, you can be happy. But the real clinical applications of coronary CT is in the emergency department where you can get a very typical heart patient where the other features like ECGs and all that are not supportive. And detection of a non-calcified plaque, evaluation after coronary artery bypass surgery, and imaging of coronary stents. Now, what I want to just discuss is a typical patient we get who, and the bulk of the patients I believe who undergo CT coronary angiography in the private sector, like Mr. DS, I'm talking about. He's 58 years, no symptoms, regularly exercises, no diabetes or hypertension, but his father died of an MI at 60 years. His cholesterol is about 255, triglycerides 104. Good HDL, 68, LDL, 166. But because of his, this one risk factor and the family history, he was prescribed as he was studying 10 milligrams. And because he was so anxious, he was advised to undergo a CT coronary angiogram. Now the result was a moderate plaque in the proximal LAD. So immediately his rosuvastatin dose was increased to 40 milligrams. And he was to diet more and exercise further. And his physician was very pleased at this result because he said it's a near serious coronary disease that required medical management. Now, are you surprised by this particular this, uh, result? You shouldn't be because we start developing our plaque from the time we are about one year old. And by the age of 50, most people would have plaque visible to a CT scan. Also, arteries narrowed by plaque are not necessarily a threat. So why should you do a CT coronary angiogram? I've just mentioned a few for and against criteria. For is to reduce the need for conventional angiograms, this invasive one. Actually, there is a certain group. We are, I'm referring to some of these rather obese ladies who are finding it very, very difficult to go on a treadmill who have typical chest pain. And actually, you don't really like to do an angiogram either because even an angiogram on such people can be quite dicey because they are because of the obesity. Now, there, if you do this and you get a negative result, since the negative predictivity is pretty good, I would say that is a good indication. Also, conventional angiograms carry their own risks because it's an invasive procedure. Cost is an interesting thing because if you take the developed countries, actually a conventional angiogram is much more expensive than a CT coronary angiogram. Not in Sri Lanka though. If you take the most popular CT machine in one of the private hospitals, which is a 640 slice CT, it costs 40,000 rupees to do it as an outpatient. While a conventional coronary angiogram in that same private hospital done as an inpatient is 43,000. So there is, it's completely different. So you have to think a little bit about that as well. Then patients coming to the emergency department with chest pain but no clear evidence of heart attack. This is a reasonable investigation. Then the fourth one is, a, is the one which I think a lot of people are talking about. That is supposing you see a patient who is asymptomatic, good effort tolerance, and he has got a critical block in his left main coronary artery or proximal LAD, both of which if he blocks it off, he can just drop dead. Now, that is what people keep talking about. Look, we found this. If it wasn't for the CT coronary angiogram, this man would have died. But this is like in a million cases, you get about a few. But uh, to just get that particular patient, you have to then screen quite a lot of people. Then reassurance, as Professor Padmeshwaran talked about, I mean, you to, just to reassure you that you are okay. You see, that's also one of the reasons. You can also rule out coronary artery disease with high negative predictive values. Now, what's against is that there is no data that the CTCA prevents heart attacks in asymptomatic individuals. Additional lifetime risk of cancer is between 1, to 1 in 200 and 1 in 5,000. Everyone is forgetting about the radiation. If you look at the amount of radiation which a conventional coronary angiogram uh, uh, 
it comes to 200 deaths uh, that many uh, grades <laughs> and uh, we actually checked up with the same uh, hospital and found out that it's 500 for a CTCA so two and a half times the radiation of a conventional coronary angiogram for a CTCA and if a block needs stenting and you find this blockage in the CTCA you have to do the conventional angiogram anyway uh, this I'd like to talk a little bit about the radiation because nobody seems to be talking about it when it comes to CTCAs. And it actually shows that now here we are talking about uh, uh, 16 slides and a 64 slides. And you can see that the 16 slides is something like 8 point something and uh, 64 slides is 11 point uh, or it's something like 15. The, the more, the faster it is, the more the radiation is. So when, uh, I don't know what the 640 slides CT is compared to this. This is also an interesting slide because if you look at it, these are the radiation doses and cancer risks reported from various CT studies. And the first two are the CT coronary angiograms, the others are head CT, chest CT, pediatric abdomen, whole body CT, and so on. And you can see that actually these have got the highest amount of uh, radiation. And just take a look at the male and female. The females are very much more at risk, and particularly if they are young females. So bear that in mind as well. Because this is again a something where actually there is the estimated lifetime attributable risk of cancer incidence associated with radiation dose from a single ECG gated CT angiogram. And this is at different ages. So you can see that these are English males and females, USA males and females, and Hong Kong males and females, all of which are very similar. But you can see a 20 year old female, whatever their these nationality is is at much higher risk of a cancer compared to its equivalent male, male counterpart. So bear in mind that when these young people come very excited about their chest pains, that you are really subjecting them to a cancer risk. I'm not even talking about the contrast because that is another aspect because again, we use more contrast for the CT coronary angiogram than for a con convention coronary angiogram. And contrast can, as you know, give rise to contrast nephropathy. Now, the only sort of clear details we, I managed to actually get was really from the United States because of their very good national health insurance program. You see, Medicare pays for all this, and Medicare will pay for your mammogram. But then there's a lot of ink up to now, there has been a lot of evidence that mammograms have been there. But Medicare had found that they were down hundreds and billions of dollars because of the large number of. CT coronary angiograms been performed. So what they did was they started, you know, thinking a bit about it, and they said that they wanted a large scale study to be conducted because there was no evidence that the CT scans provided any measurable medical benefit. But that's where they ran up against a the problem. There is now a society of cardiovascular CT uh, doctors, and there was about 4,500 at this particular point, which was in 2008. And they immediately lobbied the Congress as well as the Senate. And more than a dozen senators and 79 Congress representatives supported the society and urged Medicare to reconsider the plan. And there was so much of lobbying that Medicare gave way. So they're still paying for the CTCAs. In fact, uh, these, are, I mean, you know, these things are important, you see, because these are financial incentives. Huh? That this was in 2008, an investment per CT scanner was approximately $1 million. And in the US, you get these groups, these practice groups. So, what they do is they invest in a CT scanner. Now, they've got to make, you got to, you, I mean, now having invested in it, you have to pay for it. So, the thing is, uh, the number of private cardiology practices owning CT scanners at that point was more than 1,000. And each private facility that owns a scanner needs to conduct about 3,000 tests to pay off a scanner. But what do you do when a patient really comes with a chest pain? Now, there, this is a nice little study which was to decide, do you do a coronary angiogram immediately or do you do some screening beforehand? So what they had was, they had a target population, patients with chest pain, no history of MI, but they were able to perform an exercise test. Now, some of them were straight away sent for a coronary angiogram. Others, just exercise ECG, uh, stress echo, stress pet, 
and then the quadratic angiogram. And the conclusions were that an exercise ECG, a preferably a stress record, which is a lot more, uh, has, uh, the, the sensitivity and specificity did more, was quite adequate to diagnose mild to moderate coronary artery disease. If the patient is high risk, and now you have enough and more risk, uh, you know, how uh, the ways of assessing a risk of a patient, if a patient is high risk, you don't have to do any of these things. Go off straight away for a conventional coronary angiogram. If you have somebody who says that when he walks five yards, he gets a chest discomfort going up his throat to his jaw. You do not have to do anything else. You go for the conventional coronary angiogram. There is no point in going and doing a CT coronary angiogram, seeing some plaques there and then doing the coronary angiogram itself. So there is this promise which was the prospective multicenter imaging study for evaluation of chest pain. You see, there is one other thing you can get out of the CT which is quite useful and that is the calcium score. And here what they did was they randomized one group to for anatomical testing strategy, that's with the CT, and the functionist testing strategy, that's with the excise tests and so on. And uh, they followed up. This was a very big study because there were over more than 8,000 patients in that. And what they really sh showed was when the calcium score was either very severe or moderate, it correlated with the patient events. You can see on the y-axis. And it was the same with the functional ones. Where the functional, suppose you got a strong positive stress test because function is severe, or again a positive stress test say in the second stage or so, those also correlated with the event percentage. So, and uh, so ultimately what happened was moderate to severe abnormalities in both arms robustly predicted the events, and any abnormality on functional testing was significantly more specific for predicting events. Mm -hmm. Overall discriminatory ability of predicting primary endpoint was similar and fair for both the, primary, the calcium score as well as functional testing. So this was, as I said, the largest comparison of prognostic value for both calcium score and functional testing. It demonstrated that chest pain populations referred for testing have a low event rate and both tests have significant strengths. The coronary calcium score for future cardiovascular events and functional testing for high specificity of cardiac events. Certainly, a CT coronary angiogram provides better prognostic and discriminatory power than either of them, but the question is, do you really have to use it for screening? So, now having talked about the CT coronary angiogram, just a few words about overtreatment with stents. In 2018, over 1.8 million stents were implanted in the United States. Of course, 1 million for coronary uh, for the coronary arteries, the remainder for the peripheral vessels and various other parts of the body. But that's a lot. Now, this is how the plaque forms. I don't want to spend too much on that. But as you can see, you can have a quite a, you know, quite a good lumen, but with a thin fibrous cap, which makes it a vulnerable plaque. On the other hand, you can have a critical block with a thick fibrous cap, which is unlikely to rupture. So, you, it is really not the percentage plaque which matters, it is the vulnerability of the plaque and we still haven't had got a very uh, sort of a marketable product to go and tell us exactly how vulnerable the plaque is. Also, stenting is not without its own complications. You get stent thrombosis, either acute, subacute or late. Myocardial infarctions, your wire or balloon can cause uh, plaque shift. Coronary perforations, again with your wire and balloon. You can induce arrhythmias. You can get contrast nephropathy and you can get st a stroke. Now, these are just a touching the tip of the iceberg. These are increasingly relevant, increasingly relevant as the benefits of the procedure become less clear. And this is what's interesting. This is just some data from the United States where it really showed that because you see, US is one place where because of the amount of litigation and so on, they, a lot of people who have been doing unethical practices have actually had themselves been disbarred from practice. So, if you look at the trends, the trends are that actually it's coming down. Now, this is just 2010 and 2013. You can see that there is a 7.2% drop in the total PCIs. And if you look at PCIs per 10,000, again, there is a drop. But if you look at patients with cardiogenic shock, collar ventricular failure, there is an increase. Because those are the people who need the stents. You see, the thing is, Unfortunately, stents have been given a bad name because people are putting stents into 30% lesions, NC asymptomatic patients and so on. But stents are necessary. You need to put a stent when a patient comes with 
with this kind of situation. So here you can see that the 19,000 has become 22,000 and that's with an increase in population and 40,000 has become 59,000 in patients with left ventricular failure. So actually the number should go up with the high risk people and it should come down with the others. This is again the Medicare beneficiaries and here again you can see that actually if you just take the diagnostic catheterization which is the upper line again it, it peaked and then it's come down and it's plateaued. It's the same with the, the one with the diamonds that's the PCI is using stents and the CRDGs as you can see is on a downward trend anyway. I mean there are many reasons for this. One thing is better medical management, good risk factor control and so on. In fact that is what we should concentrate on. And my final slide is this is really from Israel and this is quite nice because it shows the trends from 2002 to 2014. And you can see that in 2002, if you look at the red line, which is the PCI, there were 387 per 100,000. It rose to the, to the, uh, right up to uh, in 2008, which are the stent mania era, where it went up to 423. And then it has now come down in 2014 to 378, which is even less than the 2002 one. And 2002, mind you, the drug code were not there. The stent mania came after the drug code stents came in. So it has actually dropped. CABG, as you can see, has been gradually dropping, and from 109 it has dropped to 46. But what's important is the way how, how this has leveled off. Unfortunately, we don't have good registries in this country, and I just couldn't trace anything from India because I don't think this will get these same figures there. So that is what I really wanted to say that the two are really related. Both the, you diagnose, you overdiagnose, and you overtreat. Because you can see something which is 80%, even though it's a perfectly stable plot, you can stent it. So the two, you might say go together, but it is important to know that, I mean, there's a lot more in this than that. And you have to really select your patients, both for investigation as well as treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I'm sure we have an interesting discussion at the end. Now, next, we'll have Dr. Gulani Kotachi the consultant in the phrenologist to talk to us on diabetes and hypertension uh, diagnosis should we lower the cutoff Uh, very good afternoon to all of you, and I must thank uh, Professor Kumar Mendes uh, for the invitation. So let's talk about diabetes and hypertension, hot topics in non-communicable disease, as well uh, as um, same as ischemic heart disease. So to begin with, I'll be talking first on diabetes and then on hypertension. So let's start with diabetes. Okay, so as you all know, diabetes is like, it's an epidemic and it's growing day by day. We see more young patients coming to us with diabetes and all has gone into now focusing on prevention. Can we prevent our generations, younger generations from getting into diabetes? So prevention is important because they have found that lifestyle interventions, giving metformin, combination that can delay or then prevent the risk of having diabetes. So the focus is on prevention. I think never there have been a doubt about diagnosis of diabetes as for the last almost 10, 15 years, we have used the same criteria of fasting more than 126, a random blood sugar of 200 with symptoms. If you do an OGTT, the two hour value of more than 200, we've taken that with an HbA1c of more than 6.5 within the last five years. So that diagnosis has not been challenged at any point because that has proven that having these cutoff values will prevent them from special with microvascular complications in the next 10 years. So the problem to our region first, can we use the same cutoff values of HbA1c 6.5, which was mainly designed for the Western world, and there have been many studies on it. I'll just highlight one of it. That's uh, done using Indians, Malaysians, and Chinese people, and they have found yes, 
we can use it. So there's no argument about using HP1C value of more than 6.5 in diagnosing diabetes in Asians as well. So both the Western and uh, us Asians will have the same. So this is abstract saying we can use the same cutoff. So I looked at retinopathy and they have said yes, 6.5 is a good cutoff value to say uh, can predict retinopathy in these all three uh, uh, people. So the problem is in pre-diabetes. So there's no question about diabetes. We know it. We know the diagnosis. But always there's a question about pre-diabetes. So when I see a patient, a young patient, coming to us with a fasting blood sugar of 102, 103, marginally elevated, they ask the question, can I get diabetes doctor? So it's all individualized because we have to assess the risk of a patient. Just seeing one report of 103, just seeing one report of 110, that does not mean that the person is having prediabetes. So that always needs to be reviewed. And now it's not specified. It is not a clinical entity. So we can't label a person as having prediabetes. It is not a clinical entity, but a risk for diabetes. It's not a clinical entity. So that will increase the risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And we use this term for people who does not match up to diabetes, but it's still high to become normal as well. So it's associated with obesity, dyslipidemia, hypertension. It's been proven, the association with prediabetes, these non-communicable diseases. So diagnosis for the last 10 years, even the 2008 ADA guidelines would give the same cutoff values of a fasting blood sugar more than 100, uh, from 100 to 125 to a value after OGTT between 140 to 199. But most recently, they have added the HP1C value of 5.7 to 6.4. So the last 10 years, we had the two cutoff values. So it has not changed over the last 10 years, the, the diagnosis of prediabetes. The WHO still uses the cutoff of 110 to uh, diagnose uh, impaired fasting glucose. So why should we diagnose prediabetes? And is the cutoff too low? That's the question in this forum. So to answer that, we need to find some evidence. So there are some prospective studies which have demonstrated special systemic reviews of 44,000 patients from 16 cohort studies. They have followed up these patients for five years, and they have said HP1C level of 5.5 to 6, they have a five-year risk of developing diabetes around 9 to 25. Percent. So, a person with an HP1C level more than 6, up to 6.5, the risk of diabetes, developing diabetes within the next 5 years is 25 to 50%. So, that is where the problem comes in. So, these people are vulnerable to have diabetes, and when we get a patient, we should, we should explain to them, not that they're just going to immediately have diabetes, but you have a 5 year risk of developing diabetes if you have an HP1C of 6 you got a 50% chance of developing diabetes within the next five years. So this is all about prevention, prevention of getting into diabetes. So Diabetes Care have published this article um, regarding the systemic review. And they have shown clearly, you can see the association between the annual incidence uh, of diabetes and the HPA1C level. So it's, it increases with the HPA1C level. It's been um, statistically proven as well. So we had a study done in 2012, the BPPP study, where we have showed that HB1C is a predictor for us to say whether a person can go into diabetes or not. So it's a very good predictor uh, to say that. So in all this, they have said HB1C level of 5.5 to 6.5, although we use 5.7 as a cutoff, this 1% will capture a large proportion of people at high risk of developing diabetes. So if you do some interventions like lifestyle interventions, if you give them metformin in indicated patients or combine in specially obese people, you can significantly reduce the risk of diabetes. So I think there's no question about the cutoff values at this point regarding the pre-diabetes or the diabetes. The problem comes also with the screening. So, 
the Western world have criteria. They say, okay, if you are Asian, you have to get yourself tested for diabetes. If you have a polycystic patient, yes. If you have had a large baby, yes, you screen for diabetes. But us, the nations itself, we are at risk of developing diabetes. So I don't think we should have these criteria for us to say whether we should get ourselves screened. No, because being Asian itself, like in JDM, we have put ourselves at risk. So that we need to screen ourselves for diabetes. So cut off with pre-diabetes, in my opinion, is not too low. It hasn't been changed for the last 10 years. But patients need to be educated regarding the risk of development of diabetes. So shall we move on to hypertension? As Professor Kumar Mendy said, the big haru about the change of guidelines was in 2017, when HA uh, decided with the American Cardiology Association that, okay, we are going to change, uh, especially the naming or diagnosis of hypertension. And uh, so I have a word about the JNC8, Joint National Committee Guidelines, which we have used from 2013. The differences and why this difference came up. So what's the change? So you can see clearly the systolic blood pressure of less than 120 80 is absolutely normal. So in JSA 7 they said it and 2017 the AHA said it. So what's the difference? The labeling of the hypertension. So JSA 7 said it's pre-hypertension when you have a systolic blood pressure of 120 to 129 and the AHA said it's elevated blood pressure. So nomenclature got different here. And they defined, JNC defined prehypertension still when the blood pressure is 130 over 139. So you can see from 120 to 139, big range, they are prehypertension. But in AHA, it's now coming to stage 1 hypertension. So more than 130 of blood, systolic blood pressure. And if you have a diastolic blood pressure over 90, you have stage 1 hypertension. So stage 1 hypertension in JNC was when the blood pressure was 140. And the AHA is only stage 2. So above stage 2, in AHA guidelines, 140 above 90, you uh, are diagnosed with stage 2 hypertension. So this is the difference between these two guidelines and the reason for the change of nomenclature from pre-hypertension to elevated blood pressure. So what we thought, if I say to a patient, you are pre-hypertensive, they might not take it seriously. So that's the reason they wanted to change the nomenclature, but that caused big chaos in the world of uh, people who manage hypertension. And so this is the guideline where they have published in 2017 under uh, high criticism uh, for the cutoffs. So the problem is regarding the targets of treatment. Okay, you can define hypertension, but then we have decided which stage we are going to treat this patient. So from the AHA guideline, they have said elevated blood pressure about 120 to 130. Don't treat. You do the lifestyle modification. You let the patient lose weight, do the diet, reduce sodium, enhance the potassium intake, reduce alcohol and smoking. That's lifestyle. So stage 1 hypertension, you might give medications if you have a cardiovascular risk, risk of more than 10%. So you have to calculate here. So all the patients above 130 will not be treated unless they have a uh, cardiovascular risk of more than 10%. So this is secondary prevention uh, for cardiovascular risk. So stage 2 hypertension, about 140, yes, you start treatment if it is persistently elevated. So the diastolic pressure goes along with it. So the difference from the JNC8, which is latest from 2013, is we treat anyone above 60 years if you have a systolic blood pressure about 150 over 90. If your age is less than 60, you have a blood pressure of 140 over 90, it's a cutoff you treat. So you can see clearly the difference of target of treatment. That is where the problem came in. Uh, people thought you are treating blood pressure at a very young, very low stage where it's not necessary to treat. But I think HA the way to it is not necessary to treat, but you have to calculate the cardiovascular risk and then decide whether you want to treat. And the reason why they got these results was the other thing. How did they come up with this 120, 130 suddenly? 
it's to do with the sprint trial. They have very, very like close together before they made this AHA guideline. And it's heavily criticized because this AHA guideline was made by the same person who was involved in the sprint trial. So it's intellectually there was um, there was uh, 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 conflicts, uh, intellectual conflict of interest. So what they say is the sprint trial head was the chairman of this AHA guideline committee as well. So the, the GP association in US, the Family General Physician Association, they refused, uh, ultimately saying we are not going to follow this AHA guideline. We are going back to what it was in 2015 and we follow that because of this intellectual problem of the interest. So they have said increase the hazard ratios for cardiovascular disease and stroke have increased to 1.1 to 1.5, but the increase was the sleep blood pressure to 120 to 129. So it's 1.5 to 2, the hazard ratio. It's two times the risk of having a, a stroke or a cardiovascular disease if you have a blood pressure above 130. This is from the sprint trial itself. So this is where the problem came in. And what they have found is the risk gradient was consistent across all the subgroups in their study and there was there's no difference with the sex or the race or the ethnicity. So this is what they really found. And there was a meta-analysis also well, as well. With one million adults, they have said, okay, if you reduce the blood pressure, mean blood pressure by two millimeters, there's seven percent reduction in risk of ischemic heart disease or mortality. Okay, we agree ten percent reduction in risk of stroke and mortality. So there's no argument about it. If you reduce blood pressure, your risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke will reduce. And same, if you like, uh, the risk of mortality will double if you increase your systolic or diastolic blood pressure by respectively by 20 and 30. So you can see with the increase in blood pressure, your cardiovascular mortality will go up. So there's no question about it. But the problem was with the lowering of the cutoff for diagnosis and treatment. As he's saying here, relative risk of cardiovascular disease go up when you have a higher blood pressure. So you can see the start of this gradient, the, the graph I've shown you, starts from systolic blood pressure of 115 or 75 and gradually it increases, but not linearly. So, so evidence suggests that blood pressure diagnosis cutoffs should be low, that's with evidence, but in real life, as I said, we have increased the number of people who are diagnosed with hypertension from 32% in the US to 46% as a huge percentage, and undue stress to the individual and the burden of healthcare cost. So it is really for us, the local guidelines to say we are going to adapt these new guidelines or we are going to stay, stick to the, the previous guidelines and Watch, uh, uh, watch and wait and see how things move on in the Western world as well before jumping and diagnosing people with uh, high blood pressure. Because in the screen trial, they have measured blood pressure when a person is seated after five minutes. When seated, five minutes, they have taken the blood pressure. But you and I know in clinic setups, we can't make a patient seat for five Bullets to do a blood pressure. The patient comes in, we measure the blood pressure. So actually, they were, uh, they have done it in a lower, in a ideal setup where we can't do it. So I think it's very really difficult to correlate your clinical with the research aspect of the trial setup into normal clinical practice. So I think it is our judgment uh, to decide on the cutoffs and treat accordingly to our patients, and at least at least have two readings. Of blood pressure when you start treatment because just seeing one's reading of 145 over 90 don't jump into diagnosis of hypertension and that must that person must have run from basal to your practice you never know so uh, be a bit liberal about diagnosis of hypertension okay thank you thank you doctor thank you for this for the talk on diabetes and hypertension, should we lower the cutoff? Thank you for the very comprehensive talk. Uh, we next have Dr. Ananda Vijayvikrama from the National Institute of Infectious Disease, and he will speak on uh, has uh, guidelines changed the diagnosis and treatment of influenza.
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Madam and Professor Kumar Mendis, for uh, inviting me for this interesting and important symposium. Uh, I think uh, nowadays we have started seeing influenza patients, so it has become a current uh, topic, which makes my talk uh, uh, probably a bit, bit more appealing and uh, easy also. Uh, uh, first, I thought of giving a brief description of influenza, but I'm sure most of you know it, even but uh, to make it complete. Uh, influenza is a respiratory illness of some nonsense caused by an influenza virus. It can be the, the symptom and the consequences can range from mild to severe. Aid, and it is a highly infectious disease, but rapidly from person to person. And the important thing is some stress of the influenza virus cause more severe illness than others. And we get this every year, in, generally in outbreaks. Uh, it's an RNA virus. There are three virus types, influenza A, B, and C. And uh, this is the, the influenza virus uh, in a, the picture form. Uh, it is important to note that there are many uh, antigens in the world. Especially important ones are hemoglobin uh, and neuromediase which change from time to time and rapidly and uh, which has led to the nomenclature of this uh, various type of influenza virus. Which, uh, this change is called antigen drift and shift. The drift is a, it's a major change in the form of one of both uh, two principal antigens that is the H and N and the antigen shift is, uh, is also the changes, uh, more radical change in those. Influenza A is, a, is one species of influenza virus. Uh, the natural host is a wild aquatic birds. Occasionally it can transmit to other species and can cause devastating outbreaks in domestic poultry and give rise to human influenza pandemic. Uh, type A is the most virulent virus and influenza type uh, of the influenza type which causes the disease. The influenza A can be subdivided into different serotypes based on antigenicity, based mainly on the, you know, the uh, H and N antigen. And uh, as I said, some of these have caused severe uh, or large outbreaks, out of which the H and N1, which, was, which caused the Spanish flu in 1918 and the swine flu in uh, 2009, the 1981 was a very significant outbreak. Then there was a H2N2, which caused Asian flu in 1957. The 3N2 caused Hong Kong flu in 1968. And then there are the uh, combination from time to time, which has caused outbreaks. Out of these, uh, and uh, sorry, influenza B is uh, almost exclusively infects human and is less common than influenza B. It mutates at a much slower rate, so there are no, not much of uh, genetic, uh, genetic diversity. Um, and reduced rate of antigenic change combined with this limited host range ensures that pandemic of influenza B does not occur. Influenza C virus infects human, dogs, and pigs, sometimes causing both severe illness and local epidemics. However, it's a less common type than other types of influenza. These are some of the pandemics causing large number of deaths, especially the Spanish flu, which was due to H1N1, uh, which the estimate of deaths during that period is about 40 to uh, 100 million. And this uh, whole picture in that outbreak where patients are managed like this. And it is estimated that it may have killed as many people as bubonic plague or black death. The majority of deaths were from secondary infections such as bacterial pneumonia. It killed between 2 to 20 percent of those infected. It mostly killed young adults with more than half of deaths in people between 20 to 40 years. And it is estimated it killed more, as many as 25 million in the first 25 weeks. So you can see there had been many 
outbreaks causing these deaths. <coughs> The symptoms, as you know, it causes a sudden onset of symptoms with fever and extreme coldness, with chills, uh, rigors, and uh, cough, nasal congestion, runny nose, sneezing, uh, body aches, those are common symptoms, uh, with fatigue and headache, and then you get watery eyes, particular rash in some people. Uh, the incubation period is about one to four days. And stress by breathing in droplets, which are produced when infected patients person talks, coughs or sneezes, or by touching an infected person or surface contaminated with the virus, and then touching your own face or, or someone else's face. With the first patient we had in our ICU uh, in 2006 years ago, I think, uh, a pregnant lady transferred from Ratnapura. She was admitted there with cough and shortness of breath. She rapidly went into respiratory failure intubated, ventilated, and it was uh, positive for H1N1. Then she was transferred to us on uh, 1st of December, where we were not ready to accept the patient to the ICU, but we had no option. Uh, she was on uh, intermittent positive pressure ventilating, need, needing high concentration of the oxygen and high feed. She was started on saltamivir and post antibiotics. She went into a spontaneous abortion, and uh, so we had to take her to DMH for the uh, dietitian and evacuation. And uh, then she developed surgical emphysema. And uh, this uh, chest x on day 4 of illness, and this uh, chest x on day 10 of illness. Um, so she had the plan when plan on ICU stay. Somehow we were able to uh, get out of the ventilator, and after more than a month of ICU stay, she went home. He's another 24 year old boy admitted with cough and shortness of breath for three days duration, had high fever and loose motion. He has to be a heavy smoker. He had rapid deterioration of symptoms. Worsening shortness of breath, oxygen saturation went down. This is just x you can see bilateral shadows, alveolar shadows. He was started on oxygen, no saltamivir. As he was getting worse, we started him on antibiotics as well. Then the x ray was getting worse, shadows somehow spreading, and he was started on CPAP. Did the CT scan of chest showing again bilateral. Involvement of lungs. You can see how the X-ray got worse, and somehow uh, he survived. So you can see this: uh, we are facing with a condition which has led to millions of deaths, and some people have rapidly deteriorated and died. So we do diagnose and uh, treat these patients, isn't it? So the question is how to manage these patients. So it is important to understand uh, how to when to test these patients. I have uh, used the latest uh, guidelines published by the uh, clin uh, clinical practice guideline by the Infectious Disease Society of America, which was published in uh, December 2018. So they have categorized this testing in different kind of patients, first in outpatients. And during influenza activity, and also when there's low activity of influenza in the community. So, what they recommend is now, um, and it is important to understand that these recommendations are not uh, for America, not for us. But I thought of uh, showing these recommendations because we don't have our recent, we, don't, we have an update, our recent recommendation. So, it is important to see what they say and then probably uh, devise recommendations for us. Uh, in the season of influenza activity, they, what they recommend is to test for people with high risk patients with acute respiratory symptoms and patients with acute tensors on respiratory symptoms and either exacerbation of chronic medical condition or non complications of influenza like pneumonia. And then also they say can consider influenza testing for patients not at high risk if the results might influence antiviral treatment decisions. Or reduce the use of unnecessary antibiotics for the diagnosis, testing, etc. And then, when the when when it is not seasonal, 
or have a low influence activity to test patients with acute onset of respiratory symptoms with or without fever, especially for immunocompromised and high risk patients. Now, uh, it is not essential to treat, uh, test all the patients in an outbreak because when there is an outbreak, the, the, the clinical diagnosis has to be made and the decision of uh, treatment should be based on the clinical diagnosis as well as the patient's clinical condition. In hospitalized patients, this is the recommendation again, uh, during influence activity, patients requiring, patients requiring hospitalization with acute respiratory illness, that means they have significant symptoms which need them to be hospitalized. Uh, and patients with acute worsening of uh, other cardiopulmonary, chronic cardiopulmonary diseases, patients in a compromised patients, Patients who while hospitalized develop acute onset respiratory symptoms. They are hospitalized for other things, but then in the hospital they deliver respiratory illness. And then during a period of low influenza activity, again patients requiring hospitalization with acute respiratory illness. And then the in immunocompromised patients. So there are some restrictions on testing of these patients. And then Based on those, we have to decide whether to start these patients on treatment or not. The available treatment at present in Sri Lanka is the Osaitamura. Other treatment available in other countries is inhaled salamura and intravenous uh, peramura. Uh, the important thing here is the study, there have been many studies done on use of Osaitamura. The benefits shown are very small. Or very limited in otherwise healthy adults. There have been significant benefits in people who have other comorbidities like uh, the immunocompromised patient due to various patients due to various reasons. But in healthy adults, the advantages shown by studies are very limited. It's limited to uh, improvement, uh, say less than one day of work or uh, one less than one day, one day hospital stay, those are the type of benefits shown by the studies. But then it is important to start treatment in high risk categories. Now, this is the high risk categories are the pregnant women, people above 60 years, 65 years or older, uh, and children younger than 2 years of age, and people with underlying health conditions like immunosuppression, asthma, diabetes, or heart disease. These categories there, there is no benefit in starting treatment on these categories. So if a patient needs hospitalization due to acute respiratory illness and if we suspect possible influenza, such patients need to be started on antivirals because they are, they are ill. And then at outpatients of any age with severe or progressive illness regardless of the illness duration patient is getting symptomatically getting worse, progressive worse. Then outpatients who are at risk of complications from influenza due to either, uh, their other comorbid factors, uh, children younger than 2 years and adults older than 2 years and pregnant women uh, or within 2 weeks of postpartum. So this is the recommended group of treatment to start on anti antiviral drugs by the uh, International Society of uh, Infectious Diseases in the latest uh, update of the guideline. Then uh, there is a question whether these patients need steroids. The recommendation is that these patients should not be on steroids as, as a dental therapy for the treatment. Uh, unless clinically indicated for other reasons. There are different reasons, say if uh, asthmatic uh, get possible influenza and if the asthma condition is getting worse, then such patient might need uh, starting steroids, but not as treatment or adjunctive treatment for influenza because it has shown to prolong the period of uh, virus uh, in the, in, the uh, in lungs. Then another, another important aspect is the starting of antibiotics. Uh, I don't know whether you noticed in the one of the slides, 
the first slide I uh, few, uh, my first slides I showed that the reason for many deaths of these patients was due to secondary bacterial pneumonia and it is the problem in our situation also and many of these patients have been started on antibiotics too early during the virus stage of the illness and by the time they get secondary bacterial infections they are resistant to many of the common use antibiotics and they die of pneumonia or they get fungal pneumonia um, unfortunately there has been a there is a practice among some people to use antibiotics as antipyretics for every fever antibiotics are being started and unfortunately they are surprising the, the patients are told that uh, they are having a viral infection and still they are given an antibiotic so then when should we start antibiotics in patients with suspected or diagnosed influenza patients. This is the, uh, the recommended uh, guideline. Investigate and empirically treat bacterial co-infections in patients who present initially with severe disease. If some, somebody comes with hypoxia with the respiratory symptoms suggestive of influenza, then we need to put them on antivirus as well as antibiotics. Then Investigate and empirical treat bacterial co-infection in patients who deteriorate after initial improvement, particularly in those treated with antivirals. So they initially improve with antivirals, but then they get secondary bacterial infection, and such patients need investigation and treatment. And then uh, we have to consider starting antibiotics those who fail to improve with antiviral therapy after three to five days of uh, treatment. And Another thing I wish to highlight is this, this guideline says to investigate and treat these patients. So these patients need sputum cultures and then start, pending the results, you can start antibiotics if the criteria fits. Regarding prophylaxis in the guideline, there is no level A evidence in the guideline to show, the latest guideline to show the prophylaxis is effective. However, they have recommended with level B2 evidence to consider anti antiviral chemoprophylaxis for the, for the duration of influenza season for adults and children aged more than three months who have the highest risk of influenza associated complications, such as recipient of hemopoietic stem cell transplant in the first six to 12 months post transplant and lung transplant recipients. So these are highly immunocompromised patients and in such patients they, are, they recommend consideration of antiviral chemoprophylaxis but the important thing is you have to give this prophylaxis until the season is over so maybe several months weeks or months this is a sort of putting a slide or two on vaccination this is what is in the latest crop and review which was published again in uh, December last year. Uh, healthy adults who receive the summary uh, of findings, healthy adults who receive inactivated parental influenza vaccine rather than no vaccine probably experience less influenza from just over 2% to just under 1%. So that's the reduction or the, the uh, effectiveness of the uh, vaccine. Which has, so there is moderate certainty evidence for the use of vaccine. They also probably experience less ILI following vaccination, but the degree of benefit when expressed in absolute terms varies across different settings. Variation in protection against ILI may be due to part uh, to inconsistent symptom classification. Just one minute more, please. Yeah. Then it goes on to say protection against influenza and ILI in mothers and newborns was more than the effects seen in other populations considered in this review. Vaccine increased the risk of number of adverse effects. Uh, that part is not very important, but the last sentence it will be very important. 15 included trials, included RCTs, were industry funded. So there had been many industry funded uh, trials on influenza vaccine. And you can see how they can influence, like the case uh, shown by a use of uh, uh, CT scans in, in America.
Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker for today is uh, Dr. Udana Ratnapala. Who doesn't have CKD? Thank you very much, sir. So I think we are coming to the last kind of lecture on uh, this mind-blowing topic. Of course, thank you, Professor Kumar Mendes, for inviting me and half of the house are my teachers. So, uh, you know, let me try to ask the first question because of that. Um, I would like to do a head count uh, out of you all. Uh, who, uh, what number would be labeled as CKD in this house? I'm sure it will be 50%. Okay. Yes. So I saw kind of a debate between clinicians and uh, statisticians and community physicians. Clinicians seems to be happy with the definitions and they're happy to do whatever that is told by um, the guidelines. But uh, I think community physicians are a bit different. They think there's a lot of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. I think I'm in, in the uh, kind of end, uh, receiving end of all this trouble being a renal physician. Let me prove it. So the first slide I am going to discuss would be the definition again, the, uh, what is chronic kidney disease. So this definition was given in 2002, later on it was amended in 2013, right? And this was developed by Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Group in uh, collaboration with National Kidney Foundation in USA. After this definition, of course, most of the countries do adopt this definition and most of the nephrologists uh, all around the world do use this definition. Now, the broad uh, definition would be CKD is defined as any abnormality in kidney structure or any abnormality in kidney function which lasts for more than three months with implications for health. If there is any problem in your kidney structure, if there is any problem in your kidney function lasts for more than three months, you have got CKD. Then there are two parts of the definition. If there are markers of kidney damage lasting for more than three months, we will be talking about these markers of kidney damage or the glomerular filtration rate, which is the amount of blood filtered through the kidney over a uh, one minute period uh, per square area. If it is less than 60, once again, it is an arbitrary value, right? Where the 60 comes from, no one knows. But we will be... Uh, uh, what we call the uh, try to criticize this definition and uh, will try to you know explain the amount of trouble that an ephlogis is in because of this uh, definition right so what are the evidence of kidney damage so if you have albumin urea more than 30 milligram per gram or just a simple uh, protein leak for more than three months you have got ckd now this could be transient due to orthostatic uh, uh, protein urea, we call it. If there is chronic inflammation process, chronic infective process, if there is albuminuria, then you have got CKD. Then any urinary sediment abnormalities, for example, if you have mi microscopic hematuria, microscopic hematuria, which could be due to renal calcular disease lasting for three months. If you have white cell cast, if you have red cell cast, or if you have overall fat bodies due to nephrotic syndrome, you have got CKD. Then any electrolyte abnormalities and tubular disorders, for example, renal tubular acidosis type 1, 2, 3, 4, or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, or potassium or salt based in nephropathies, lasting for more than 3 months, you have got CKD. I am sure many of you have one of these. Then uh, histological changes, if you undergo biopsy, if there are glomerular changes like glomerulopathy, tubular changes like tubulopathy, or vascular changes, still you have got CKD, and this is more important. Uh, you know, it's a quite a practice for uh, our areas to do a scan of the kidneys. And if there is a uh, Bosniac type 2 cyst, which lasts for 3 months, if there is a calculi causing obstruction and hydronephrosis for 3 months, if there is renal artery stenosis for 3 months, um, if there is dysplastic kidney, single functioning kidney, or if there is polycystic kidneys, or any cystic kidney for that matter, if it is there for 3 months, you have got CKD. So you can see the definition is so loose. If we adapt to this definition, there will be loads of CKDs and we will be overwhelmed with birth. So they came with the second definition. So the second definition is reduce GFR of 60 mils per minute per standard square meter. Now whether the 60 is going to solve our problem is the question. Now this value was 
obviously obtained from a young adult's GFR, which is roughly 120 mils per minute. So they have roughly taken a value of 60 and told us this is the cutoff for CKD. Now, to come up with the absolute GFR, you have to do uh, what we call you have to give a substance to the patient which is excreted by the kidney, then measure the concentration in the plasma, measure the concentration in the urine and the volume, and you have to calculate the absolute GFR. Uh, by using inulin, chromium, EDTA, technetium, so on and so forth, which is a cumbersome procedure, it's an expensive procedure. So, for clinical purposes, we can't use absolute GFR, as you all know. So, what we are doing these days is uh, there are formulas to calculate estimated GFR by using a molecule in the body, such as creatinine, no cysteine C. Now, do you think it's without any trouble? It gives rise to loads of trouble. Now, these are the three frequently used uh, formulas in uh, the country or in the world at the moment. So, factor of 12, there is a creatinine at some point and as the denominator, age. And also in MDRD calculation, uh, then creatinine comes in and age comes as the denominator. And CKDAP, no difference, age comes as the de uh, denominator. So, as you can see, if the age comes as the denominator, by increasing the age alone, what will happen to your GFR? It will drop. Right? So I'm sure I'm not going to tell my age, but if I compare with uh, my teacher who has got same creatinine, she will have CKD, I will not have. Let me prove it. So this is the calculation I did. Oh, oh, sorry, before going to the calculation, now this is the guideline by using the GFR. They have defined five categories. All of you know that CKD stage one to five, and by alveolin urea micro, macro, and more than that. So we call subnephrotic. So this is A1, A2, and A3. So this gives some idea about the prognosis of the patient. But even patient with normal GFR, patient will be in CKD stage 1 category. Okay. So now this is the effect on age on eGFR alone. You and me as So for example, there are three people. All are, say, all are males, 30 years, 60 years, 85 years. And the creatinine is 1.2, the upper limit of normal. All have all are muscular people, so they are not like me, right? Obviously not like you. And none seems to be muscular in this group anyways. So 1.2 is good for a muscular person, not for you all. But 1.2 in 30, 60 and 85 males, all are non so Asians. Now I am going to use the MDRD formula for CKDAP formula, which can be downloaded from the Google App Store. And I have calculated, first, first for the 30-year-old gentleman, the EGFR comes to 71. For the 60-year-old patient, the EGFR comes to 62. For the 85-year-old patient, the EGFR comes to 58. For this 85-year-old gentleman, which doesn't have any evidence of CKD whatsoever, will be categorized as CKD stage 3A. Accepted? Not accepted. Okay, we'll see. Yeah, the next question we see, now this is only because of the report given by the private sector, government sector, who uh, EGFR calculated by your formula. If you go with EGFR alone, you will be over-diagnosing CKD, right? Then you use the gender. Oh, it's tremendous, the gender difference between, you know, uh, the effect of gender on creatinine. Once again, this uh, gentleman, male, 30 years, creatinine is 1.2. Female, 30, creatinine is 1.2, but huge female, I would say. Yes, then we will calculate the EGFR using MDRD. Male, the same calculation, 71 mils per minute. Look at the female at 30 years of age, very young. EGFR comes to 53, the diagnosis, CKD stage 3A. So you will refer to me. It's good for the private practice, but not good for the government practice. You see? So this is the problem in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a country. I have got very limited experience when compared to my teachers. But uh, we don't mind the increased number of patients in the country. But uh, in the private practice especially. But these are problems. These are unnecessary referrals. Right? Then uh, what does this definition does? If you, uh, you know, select CKD depending on the definition alone, or markers of KDD, you know, it's like a fishing trawler which captures many more innocent subjects than it should. So the plan was to catch maybe tuna, but there are dolphins, there are spread, and all the uh, problems are there in the CKD group. If you were, if you come to my clinic, uh, 
where I get that matra or in Badulla, where they do screening programs, I will get all these referrals from uh, presidential task force and all these screening programs. You know, it's very sorry to say, but they are doing the correct thing of screening, but the screening has no purpose. So that what has happened to CKD screening in the country, but they have a kind of captured lot of high serum grade, that's good, but there are loads of uh, false referrals or unnecessary referrals due to the screening program as well. So let's, let's look at the statistics from the developed countries, these from uh, USA, estimated prevalence of CKD from 2001 study based on age and gender registered creatinine was only 1.7%, so roughly 1 in 50 accepted that the CKD rate we would uh, think that is there in USA, but estimated prevalence of new definition, the CKD from new definition, USA it has risen to 14%, and Australia it has risen to 1 in 6, 16 percent. So by using this definition, if you refer patients depending on this definition alone, there will be loads of CKD. So benefits of overdiagnosis, of course there are benefits of gain this kind of a definition. We might be able to early detect and slow or stop or reverse progression towards end-stage renal failure. As you all know, end-stage renal failure is incredibly difficult to manage in any country in the world because of the costs involved. Now, hemodialysis, if you do in the private sector, one uh, session is 10,000 rupees and three times a week, 30,000 rupees, and it will be 1 lakh 20,000 rupees per month and it will be 14 lakhs per annum. So, I'm sure I can't afford it. I don't know how many in the uh, audience can afford that kind of uh, money for dialysis. And the transplant, like don't transplant, plus 18 lakhs to 31 lakhs in the private sector. You see, it, uh, it, it's huge cost for end stage renal failure. So if we detect these kind of people early, we might be able to uh, slow down the progress. That's one theory. And end stage renal failure reduces the lifespan significantly. You know, when, a, when we start a patient on dialysis at the age of 65 in the best of breast centers, the lifespan is only two and a half years, right? Even in developed countries. So if we can stop people going to end stage renal failure, there will be a benefit. And reduced EGFR or albuminuria were consistently associated with higher cardiovascular mortality. So, lower your EGFR or higher your albuminuria, the chance of developing a myocardial infarction or a stroke is high. Because of that, if we halt this uh, EGFR at a higher level or albuminuria at a lower level, there may be benefit for the patient. So, these are the rationale. And of course, late referral for CKD, I'm sure. Uh, the problems uh, faced by the physicians in the past and nephrologists uh, in the now, nowadays, there are a lot of crash landers we call it. People come with creatinine of 500 from nowhere and they become uranic, you have to put a line, line gets infected or patient can throw arrhythmia and patient can die uh, on admission also and the outcome is poor. So you can't plan any renal replacement therapy if the patients come late. And CKD is the most important risk factor for AKI. So if you know that this patient has got CKD, for example, with a patient of creatinine of 1.2, if patient is uh, labeled as CKD, of course, uh, uh, when patient comes with the influenza A, uh, of course, the clinicians will be more what we call cautious in giving the oseltamia dose. You know, the dose is 75 will become BD. Now it's a frequent AKI see for patients with CKD stage 3 and below, you can't give oseltamia 75 BD, you have to down 75 daily, or sometimes 30 weekly uh, in uh, CKD stage 5 and so on and so forth. So this dose reduction is not happening in the normal day-to-day -day practice. So if the patient is labeled as CKD, people will uh, take precautions. For example, cardiologist, pneumonia, madam, and all, if patient comes with uh, 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 myocardial infarction, they will be more cautious and might do a referral also for contrast prophylaxis and they might not go and do a, uh, what we call contrast uh, study on them straight away. So, there is a benefit of labeling these patients as CKD and of course increased public and professional awareness. I think it's more than, uh, you know, I think Sri Lanka is the country which has given uh, most emphasis for CKD at the moment, starting from the uh, His Excellency himself. Just coming to the drawbacks, so cost implications of diagnosing, treating and follow-up. I think uh, we have been discussing from the early afternoon that we have to treat thousands of patients to prevent one end stage renal failure, peak end stage renal failure, like those uh, examples I discussed. 
and adverse effects of labeling healthy and asymptomatic people as having chronic kidney disease. Now there is a huge problem of CKD patients being labeled as CKD. If you come to my clinic on a Wednesday, there will be at least 30 patients waiting in a queue to get my signature for benefits from social services department. But actually most of them are what we call the resolved ACL or nephrotics with normal creatinine who can go and do any work at their will. But most patients do play a sick role when you uh, label them as CKD. They don't do any work, not even look after their grandchildren. So most of my patients are like DLW, they would wait at home, come and uh, see me in the clinic and go back and do the DLW job at home. So that's why I don't like over diagnosing patients, they don't go to work and uh, that decreases their quality of life. Then thirdly, this is some area that uh, I like to emphasize on patients could be falsely identified as having CKD and receive unnecessary treatment and diagnostic interventions. I think this is a problem that we see as nephrologists. For example, uh, as a junior nephrologist, I see this regime being practiced in the country. If a patient is diagnosed with CKD, may at the general practice or at the physician level, or at the nephrology level itself, uh, we might start this, this regime. So first is no proteins. No low protein diet. That's the first advice they get when they are diagnosed with any CKD stage. Then the next advice is Kahabata Elol Paltru Kandave, Gaslavu, Kahelgedi, Vatana Vatata, Pamilian, Pala, Kira Kandave. So you can't eat anything. Then the third thing is there is a thing called CKD regime. Most of the doctors do start this patient on calcium carbonate, 1 alpha, uh, alpha calcidol, and uh, iron folic acid vitamin B complex. Let me um, uh, look this from a more analytical side effect. Now, low of protein is not good for any uh, grade of CKD. They need proteins because your muscle mass is due to proteins. You can't maintain muscle mass. You develop proximal myopathy and all your enzymes, cofactors, need essential amino acids. So, the, even the guidelines have recommended at least amount of, sorry. So, this is the classical picture of a European patient who is being dialyzed. And this uh, uh, the typical subcontent patient, you can see, you can barely see any muscle here. And he is nicely, you can see the muscles and he is well built because of very low protein that prescribed well. Yeah. Now the recommendation is to give 0.8 grams per kilogram the minimum. So even for a 50 kilogram patient, I don't say 50 kilograms here, all are 60 and above. No 50s nowadays. Anyways, so this is for a 50 kilo patient, you can give two servings. And that would be 230 gram pieces. So, we can have size scale, they got masmalu kind of bulan So, that's the amount we should give. The minimal amount we should give, and the maximum would be four and a half pieces of fish show meat. So, I think it's a wrong advice, and this wrong advice given for a wrong diagnosis is going to create trouble and it's going to uh, result in proximal myopathy and uh, no muscle power to withstand dialysis, to withstand. Transplant. So most of are like the LW because of the wrong advice. Second wrong advice. Low potassium diet. Now should we advise low potassium diet in all? That's again a mistake we do. Now potassium is needed for polarization of cells and for muscle function and for nervous function you need potassium. So it is very clear that when the potassium goes above 5 uh, milliequals you should advise on Oh, start cutting down potassium until such time you need to give a normal potassium diet. So giving this wrong advice for wrong diagnosis is detrimental and it has happened over the, uh, over the years. Third, giving, can you give calcium carbonate and one nap? Now this is a routine practice. People can disagree with me but it's a routine practice to add these two. Uh, thinking that patient is vitamin D deficient, thinking that patient uh, needs calcium due to hypothalcemia, but all of us know that there are five types of uh, mineral bone disease due to CKD itself. So if it is a clear-cut CKD, uh, this may be a clear-cut CKD and still you can have five types of uh, mineral bone disease. So if you put 1-alpha calciferol or vitamin D uh, blindly, for example in secondary hypoparathyroidism with high prostate, what will happen? The action of vitamin D is to absorb more phosphate, so phosphate level will be, become more high and phosphate is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular mortality. So there will be more work for the cardiologist. 
more mice, more stores. I think that's what we have been doing. Very good. But second example, if the patient is in either in a bone disease, uh, if you give too much uh, vitamin D again, once again, the bone marrow will shut down, the bone growth will stop. So all in all, we should do a proper assessment of mineral bone disease. So to diagnose correctly, then treat properly. So this is my last slide. Take home messages. Chronic kidney disease of, is obviously overdiagnosed. But most of the clinicians won't uh, take EGFR alone. There should be a rise in serum creatinine, at least above 1.2 according to current assay methods. Or there should be evidence of kidney damage like um, proteinuria or microscopic hematuria or ultrasonic evidence, so on and so forth. Then clinicians should be skeptical about CKD diagnosing marginal cases, especially in elderly, and look for evidence of kidney damage to support the diagnosis of CKD and liaise with nephrology services if in doubt, and never label a patient with CKD until conclusive evidence, and individualize CKD treatment and don't overtreat. So with that, I would like to invite you for World Kidney Day celebrations at Badulla. We will be having a public walk and speech, and if you happen to be doing any sessions, of this or something else at Badulla, please come and join us on 4th April at Provincial General Hospital Badulla. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Udana Rathapar, for that very interesting, uh, well, the last but I said in a very interesting uh, talk. And now, and it kept us, you know, um, it kept us uh, alert. Right. So uh, I now uh, open for discussion. Any questions? Any suggestions? Any any uh, views? Any points of view? Uh, I have a question. Yes. No, I feel the recommendation does not say there is a good place for that. Only recommendation is that uh, if the patient is in a severe case, you can prolong the course of treatment. Uh, Generally, you can prolong for five days or something like that. But if the uh, uh, severe case, uh, you can prolong the course of treatment. Unfortunately, uh, some, some serious that uh, do we have any preparation in Sri Lanka? Now, if a young person comes in the Kapurvani village, like now, uh, with symptoms of influenza, it's not essential to do the influenza test, isn't it? No, sir. Actually, it is not essential to do either the testing or the no, yes. 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 the treatment. Yes. 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 It's a common thing. It's a good song. 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 And they can be managed at home. It's yes. simple. And yes. six and bed rest and and fluids. Yes. Yes. Yeah. These yeah. the common practice on the private sector to ask the influenza. Yeah. Yeah. Very expensive test. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I'm sure we will very soon we will end up with some kind of resistance. Yes. Yes. And the rate is being given. Yes. But then once you decide to give us this drug and flu. Within 24 hours, you see an improvement also. That's uh, my experience. Yes, uh, there's implementing improvement, but again, I think it varies uh, from the people to people. Uh, because mm -hmm. some patients come with uh, digital symptoms, this sometimes with a positive report also. They said uh, they felt uh, maybe that yesterday and today they are feeling better. So, for such patients, I don't uh, start with them, even though they yeah. can make them with a positive report. The renal proxy doctor is also in case it is yeah, yes. yes. I have heard during the last one year, Pinkamali, Mardara, and Badul, in all three areas. But uh, I have come from Yosalpina and you know, use scrap toxic and in all three parts of the country. Yeah, yeah, that is very important, especially yes, when you get the CSP patient. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I, I think this uh, too much of awareness is, is put on the testing, treatment as well as vaccination when it comes to treatment. Is there a difference in you see that we are in fasting and non-fasting state? Yes, there will be because yes. they, yeah, they have been tested in by 
of those muscle mass, amount of uh, water in your body. So fasting sample is not ideal to do a creatine. So creatine should be done after three days of resting. Ideal. Right? We can't do this in the daily day practice. Uh, three days of normal uh, exercise, not uh, aggressive exercise, normal kind of day day work. And of course, uh, ample amount of water, 2.5 milliliters according to the thirst, and then you should do the care. Yeah, we find this as a fact before we do a we see the scan. But now we are using the special fasting blood sugar, scale and they need every one person. Yeah. So they come fast in the lab. Yeah. And they do both fasting sugar and clear uh, green, and we get a two upper I, I see the green, you can go in the easy. And the thumb again. Yeah, so the idea is that we should yeah. do a fasting. Yeah, in the laboratory it was advised. That's true. And uh, once again, there are two methods of treating the fairy that's in country also. So, the FA method gives a high value, 0.3 you know, times higher, and enzymatic method gives a low value. So, private sector, high five, private sector is enzymatic, and most of the government hospitals do the FA. So, there is a difference between the FA and the different laboratory laws. So, once again, if you pick the laboratory, you think it's correct, you have to stick to that laboratory and do serum therapy that particular kind of uh, about the others, it's very difficult to do it with this API or the other The SMD is a bit better. SMD is better. Uh, but in the government sector still, we don't try to have it. May I ask Dr. Amrasena, now in a patient who comes with typical engine on exertion, with a normal resting ECG, you say they are in no place for exercise ECG. With a normal resting ECG, that's it. Yes, and then the abdomen if the patient has got a lot of function. I don't answer that. I don't But the symptoms of the person has a symptom. You know, pressure or the body. Or just when they have a they have a they have a they have they have a they have they have of his training and stuff like that. What you call the typical symptoms? I don't think you can see Because the CG will be abnormal because you don't want them to do that. New year before that. So there is no place for doing exercise CG and you no, that is also normal. normal. It's very dangerous. No, if the normal is this thing and uh, yes. You may have a, you may have a normal CG, but supposing you have a reference stenosis. Is what is causing the which is what is causing the symptoms. So, I'll be having appetite, everything is present. Austrian development, stenosis, and nothing else. And because you have come to that point, then you're getting the symptoms. You might have a bad pain and you're going to have a bad pain, and you have to get out. So, the thing is, it is a problem. So, if you can see those symptoms, you should not ask for treatments because it's a symptoms. So, in what indication would you ask for a treatment then? Then you will proceed to angiograms then. Right. You may. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now when studies are done between uh, the CT angiograms and then and the normal angiograms, uh, it's a gold standard. No? Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
So there are uh, there's, there are some questions from the audience who are watching this on the webinar, and I think it's for you, Dr. Alayar. No, some controversial, I suppose. About CKD. So the question was question. Once again, we don't have uh, criteria in this country, but in other countries, it's CKD stage 3 and below. So if the EGFR, once again, though it's, you know, we don't like it, we have to go by it. If the EGFR is less than 60, we have to refer to a nephrologist to see whether, first of all, to see whether these uh, component of, uh, whether there is acute component is there, whether, to, uh, whether there is any possibility to revert it. Second thing, to prevent progression. Third thing, if the course is not found, if the course is not clear, to do a biopsy and immunology screening and to come up to an etiological diagnosis. For these three reasons, in other countries, they, uh, they uh, like the patients to be referred at EGFR of 60. But uh, Sri Lankan situation, I am not sure whether we can take all these patients uh, below EGFR 60 to our nephrology uh, kind of uh, workup because we have got only 32 nephrologists in the country so far. And uh, with the workload we have got, and especially the areas I work with the amount of CKDVC, for example, Badul, uh, we have to do screening. It is against because every other patient is having uh, high serum creatinine. And if I want to uh, pick up a donor of your family, say, for example, I have an stage patient, I ask the mother or the brother to get a creatinine and that, uh, to get it done to do uh, what we call um, to do the donor workup. Invariably, they have high serum creatinine, especially the patients from Mahiangana, Mondragala. There's a huge population of CKD, and the other places I worked in Trincomalee and all, um, there's a huge problem. But in Colombo, I think you all are safe, and Matra also, uh, things are relatively safe. Um, the reasons I don't know, but the uh, prevalence is exceptionally high in those areas, affected areas, by so called CKDU. So, uh, still, uh, it would be uh, CKD stage 3 and we do EGFR of 60. So, can I ask a few questions because uh, as a illiterate kid, I am a little bit confused now. Uh, we are confused. Uh, before I came here, I had some form of negative, but I am really confused because uh, you confused me. Uh, <laughs> From the nephrologist. That's true, you know. regarding my question whether we should uh, you know do a is trying to you know make a conflict between myself and my teacher <laughs> so i would say this is kind of uh, i don't know this may be a 
uh, generation gap. But whatever it is, uh, you know, it's very clear in the 2013 guidelines and there is evidence. And of course, we when you compare patients from uh, UK or other countries, we have visited China and so on and so forth. The CKD patients, you know, they have got muscle mass and they can withstand dialysis or they can withstand transplant. But here it's very difficult for our patients to withstand dialysis. You see, our usual life expectancy on dialysis is less than one year for most of the patients. And we don't do three times a week one reason. And our what we call renal dietary advisors are entirely wrong. And uh, once again, it's the famous MCQ for MRCP nephrology. One important question is uh, what is the leading cause of mortality in dialysis populations? One, hyperkalemia, two, fluid overload, three, myocardial infarction, so on and so forth. But the answer is malnutrition. So you see the amount of malnutrition and the problems caused by malnutrition. So the pendulum has changed maybe from 2015. Now we are planning to give adequate nutrition and we need to individualize nutrition not so once again when I came to National Hospital after completing my foreign training the renal sorry the dietitians and all came to me and asked for a leaflet for all the patients on dialysis all the patients for CKD stage 3 CKD stage 4 so on and so forth but you can't give a leaflet for any patient that cannot be practiced because this may be a CKD potassium wasting what I say, maybe 3.2, 3.3. This may be a case of uh, polyuria and sodium wasting. Then you have to keep a normal salt diet. So, you know, it should be individualized. So, until we get renal nutritionists or renal dietitians, or nephrologists getting trained in renal nutrition, uh, there will be a, a problem in this practice. And, uh, you know, I have a huge problem with my colleagues. Also, you know, my advice is quite different from my senior colleagues' advice. So, you know, uh, usually, uh, but patients do like to hear not to eat rather than to eat. So they like it. Probably this is a tip for private practice. So my private practice may be low. We'll see in the future. <laughs> but people like to hear not to eat rather than to eat. So this. Yes. And almost farmers are already thin. Yeah. yeah. They, they don't have much. They already thin. They already wasted. Yeah. So when you put them on low protein diet, it just aggravates uh, the problem. And look at me. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And then the moment oh, the creatinine goes up slightly, somebody will go and take that. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yes, correct. So that's why I have to give a lecture. On mix and pets and CKD, so these are all mix, you know, you should continue local as far as possible until EGFR of 30, that means, you know, CKD stage, just before CKD stage 4, even early CKD stage 4, metformin is that important to prevent cardiovascular mortality. So, you know, metformin is a myth again, and of course, non-steroids, you know, there is a myth again that some non-steroids are safe, once again, Sulintec, it is notorious. Uh, among fish agents to be prescribed for CKD, but it's proven, um, you know, point blank that no non steroid is safe and uh, you should minimize the use of non steroids. There are a lot of myths in CKD, so no, we might have to put some effort to, you know, change the practice. Uh, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. But metformin is also promote weight loss. But whether metformin is uh, needed for cardiovascular disease prevention, so that's what you know. CKD people die of myocardial infarction, not from end stage renal failure. Most of them before reaching end stage, you know that's what. So it's all cardio renal. So metformin is a must in uh, most of the patient, even in. People. That's true. Yeah. No, it's it's. Yeah. yeah that's right. So we we had this problem. Yes. Further strengthens that idea. Metformin calls the renal. 
unless you explain it to them they yeah. will carry the message so we recently did a gp session myself and my endocrinologist at mathur he conducted a combined session on diabetic kidney disease and clear the advice from endocrinologist boss you can stop metformin when egfr comes down to 30 but inform the patient this is not because of nephrotoxicity of metformin this is because we can't give this drug uh, when the kidney is this uh, this is not due to so whenever you stop metformin you have to tell the patient that metformin is uh, very important but you can't give this important drug now if the kidney has gone on its own to egfr of 30 now if you don't tell that to the uh, public community it's, it's a difficult myth to come patients will have high fever and uh, similarly lot of other conditions similarly uh, the same anxiety is there in patients uh, with dengue especially when dengue is diagnosed so this just the high fever is not a criterion for admission and not a criterion for start mosaltan uh, uh, it is the respiratory severity of the respiratory symptoms and signs is the no other symptoms is the signs Whether they are becoming hypoxic, whether they are respiratory, whether they are becoming dyspneic, and whether their respiratory rate is increasing, those are the criteria on which we have to base our decision on the starting certain way. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, one thing is expensive. When there is no use on uh, other patients starting, then will not give rise to any, any benefit. <laughs> Yeah. So I think that's the question I pose for the audience. Uh, one clear, uh, the next stop will be the SLMA session. Madam has already agreed to have a symposium uh, over diagnosis of cancer. I think we on the table uh, on the agenda, and uh, at least two people. Uh, from the bnj i just was reading the email from the indian edit of the uh, bmc who wrote very two nice articles on the o diagnosis she has agreed to come and the doctor in australia sri lankan doctor dr uh, tanya patiran she has agreed to come uh, and it was the thing that is one thing but i think these are all theoretical uh, one to two hour limited stuff how can we move this message to our doctors and the general public i mean we we are very happy to have this session and then go away encouraged by most private hospitals and private consultations yeah so so those who have funds especially an insurance uh, uh, yeah so they will get to diagnose and over treated so the sleme should co- sort of collaborate with the college of gps and have some gui- guidelines yeah uh, to have guidelines because you have to have a feedback for the public yeah the public Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
And you won't give him a DVD. You won't give him a DVD. <laughs> and the other thing is these packages those mm. so they come from these private companies all the time they are mm. I'm sure they are being promoted by the private companies yeah they are very young man getting out of some of the so actually it is catered for the people with insurances but unfortunately even the poor man get carried away so can we add that these are the